During these four days, John, Paul, George and Ringo have been the sole occupants of the 33rd floor of New York's Warwick Hotel. To get within half a mile of the hotel, you have to prove to police at specially erected barriers that you are either staying there or are visiting another building nearby. Even the hotel's employees have to show a Beatle pass to get to work. Why are you so disappointed? Because the police wouldn't let us in to see the Beatles. We had tears if we were supposed to meet a newspaper reporter through at 5 o'clock and we were there and the policemen wouldn't let us through. Why do you want to see the Beatles so much? Because they love them, they're great. We love them. Wonderful. At the Warwick itself, there are guards in the lobby and on floor 33. But the same security which has kept the Beatles fans out is also keeping the Beatles in. On the night we arrived last Friday, the Beatles had to cancel a plan to go to the Copacabana and see the Supremes. The atmosphere in the streets here is hot and sticky, which stimulates Beatles frenzy. And the police refused to allow the Beatles out in case riots started. And on Monday night, the Beatles had to say no to a Frank Sinatra invitation to a late night dinner party. George Harrison said, We would love to go, but the police won't give permission for anything because we would cause a lot of chaos if we went out. Sinatra's representative was sent on his way with word that the Beatles would be pleased to entertain him in their suite if he'd care to visit. But he didn't care. Del Shannon, Bob Dylan, and the Supremes were the only callers. Another star disappointed earlier in the day was Paul Anker. He arrived to wish the Beatles well but he wasn't able to get to floor 33. On Saturday, the Beatles were sprung from their hotel by a prepared plan and driven through the streets of New York, with a heavy police escort, to the CBS studios to film their appearance for the Ed Sullivan Show. The journey was not a difficult one because all traffic had been stopped minutes beforehand on that route. At the show they renewed their friendship with Ed Sullivan who welcomed them back to America and then got back to rehearsals. John Lennon later said, We have never worked so hard before in our lives. They couldn't get the sound balanced and by 6 o'clock we were ready to give it in and go home. I sympathized with him. For four hours I sat in the studio with Cilla Black, who is also on the television show, while the Beatles went over and over their numbers as engineers fiddled with the controls. The boys did exactly the same program of songs as they featured in Blackpool Night Out on August 1st. After it, they went back to their 33rd floor prison. I traveled to Shea Stadium on Sunday night with Mick Jagger, Keith Richards and their manager Andrew Oldham, after spending the day with them on board a luxury yacht called Princess, which belongs to the Stones American lawyer Alan Klein. During the day I talked with the Beatles over the yacht's radio telephone, and Mick spoke to George Harrison about plans for that evening. At that stage, the Beatles were anxious to come aboard the yacht after their show, but police security later prevented it. George was talking through the hotel switchboard but during the conversation he gave us the hush-hush number of a private line to their suite. However, he didn't realize that he was speaking to us on a radio telephone with something like 2,000 other vessels in the Hudson River Basin tuned in. Needless to say, the secret number was jammed for the rest of our stay in New York. After the call, and as we lazed in the sunshine, Mick said, I don't envy the Beatles. Look how much freedom we have and they're locked up in their hotel bedrooms without being able to take a car ride, let alone do something like us. Then Mick played Bob Dylan's latest single Like a Rolling Stone. Mick said, it was pressed secretly for us eager maniacs. Mick danced on the deck in the extrovert style that identifies him on stage. We found out that a radio station had monitored the call and broadcast the Stones' plans to land at a berth near the stadium. We had to run ashore and jump into a waiting car which took our small party through an entrance at the side of the stadium. This is John Lennon of the Beatles. There's nothing like WMCA good guys in Liverpool. As our thanks to the good guys for spreading Beatle mania in America, we're going to be the first to spread good guy mania in England. On our way in, we were to gaze amazed at the 56,000 ticket holders stacked in tiers from the open side of the horseshoe-shaped stadium. The roar of the crowd already enjoying the show was like a dozen jets taking off. Without any doubt it was the greatest most awe-inspiring sight any of us had ever witnessed. We were rushed in through the artist's entrance and met the Beatles, who were standing ready to go on stage. Oh, it's the famous Stones, John yelled. A harassed cop said, who are all these people? Nobody can stand in the aisle, there's a fire regulation. George quipped, put it out then. The cop gave in, just as the Beatles were called on stage. 
they had to run across the baseball diamond to the rostrum in the center. And as they did, 56,000 fans went hysterical. Right here at Shea Stadium on the Dean Anthony Show on WMCA Radio, coming to you on a Sunday night. They're doing now the title tune of their, the first movie, A Hard Day Night. We knew beforehand that this had to be the Beatles' greatest concert with an audience like that. But nobody could have foreseen the pandemonium unleashed as the four went through hit after hit, building the fevered excitement with each number. The crowd roared approval as Lennon played an organ with his elbow in I'm Down. And many fans broke through the 2,000-strong police cordon around the edge of the baseball diamond only to be brought down in rugby tackles by a new line of guards nearer the stage. It was an unbelievable experience. But it was also a great relief when it all ended. The Beatles are doing their last number of the night. I can't make it out from here. They're doing their final number at the moment. I still can't make out what it is. There was a great tension, not only from the brilliance of the Beatles, but from the feeling of apprehension of what could happen if the crowd got out of control. But it was all's well that ends well. The Beatles have left the stadium. They walked off the uh, bandstand, which is located at second base. And I'd say between 30 and 50 people jumped out of the stands. They were quickly subdued by the police. The Beatles were whisked from the bandstand by one of the New York Mets official cars, a white station wagon, back to the left field bullpen. Then they switched from that car into that Wells Fargo red and white armored truck out there. <laughs> and away they went. I guess they're back on their way to the Hotel Warwick in Manhattan right now. The crowd hasn't moved. People are dismantling the bandstand. And everybody's just standing here, mesmerized by the Beatles cheering away wildly and having a ball. It's been quite a night. The Beatles own this town tonight. Beatlemania has struck In the hotel afterwards, George said, it was terrifying at first when we saw the crowd, but I don't think I have ever felt so exhilarated in my life. It was unbelievable that so many people wanted to see us. Even though we are used to big crowds, this surprised us. John added, it would have been better still if we could have heard what we were playing. I wasn't sure what key I was in in two numbers. It was ridiculous. Paul said, fantastic, wonder if we'll ever be able to do it again. Ringo nodded but said nothing. Later, the Stones joined the Beatles in a rave-up celebration, back on floor 33.